small cell lung cancer in high-risk patients. She's from the uh, group in Pisa, Italy. Dear colleagues, good morning. It is estimated that uh, about 20% of patients with stage 1 or 2 no small cell lung cancer cannot be operated due to their comorbidities. And on the other hand, the vast majority of untreated patients with uh, early stage no small cell lung cancer will die due to their lung cancer rather than other causes. So, um, in this scenario, it is easy to understand the necessity of other uh, alternative therapies. Uh, during the last decades, uh, the role of global resection, such as a wedge resection, uh, were evaluated in many papers, and uh, it appeared uh, a valid compromise for patients that uh, were evaluated uh, unfit for lobectomy. On the other hand, other minimal invasive non-surgical therapies were developed, such as uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy, cyber knife, and uh, radiofrequency ablation. After a preclinical study, radiofrequency ablation is routinely performed in our department. And thus, we decide to retrospective study um, all patients uh, with stage 1 no small cell lung cancer that uh, underwent wedge resection or radiofrequency ablation during the period of 2000, in January 2006 and December 2010. These are the clinical data of these uh, patients. The two groups uh, appear to be comparable in terms of gender and uh, lesion diameter. However, the radiofrequency ablation group was older, significantly older, with higher comorbidity score and with worse performance status. These are our results. No death occurred in both groups. Morbidity consisted in prolonged eye leaking and uh, anemia, one dysense and atrial fibrillation for the wedge resection group while in the radiofrequency ablation group, uh, it uh, consisted in uh, two panoplorax requiring chest tube drainage and two pleural fusion that were mm -hmm. medically treated. However, we have to consider that uh, these data are not directly comparable due to the different degree of invasiveness of the two therapies. And this is also true for postoperative stay, because in the wedge resection group, uh, the mean postoperative stay was uh, 6.8 days, uh, while in the radiofrequency ablation group uh, it was uh, 1.4 days. Also, the two groups were comparable in terms of um, TNM staging. However, the radiofrequency ablation patients were uh, clearly clinically staged. The median, for the median follow up was uh, 29 months for wedge resection and 34 months for radiofrequency ablation, and these data are comparable. The um, overall recurrence weight rate was comparable with, between the two groups uh, with no statistically significant difference 22% <coughs> for wedge resection and 37% for radiofrequency ablation. However, we found a statistically significant difference in local recurrence rate. It was about it was 33% for radiofrequency ablation and only 12% for wedge resection. This is the actuar actuarial overall survival curves. The three-year overall survival was Mm, the same for wedge resection and the radiofrequency ablation, and we found no statistical significant difference. However, in, mm, we found a tendency towards uh, better survival if we consider cancer-related uh, uh, survival, uh, cancer-related death. Uh, mm, at the three-year survival, the three-year survival rate was 71% uh, for wedge resection and 78% for radiofrequency ablation. However, this study has some limits. 
Firstly, the limited series from a single institution. Secondly, it is a non-randomized uh, retrospective study. All these patients were evaluated in a multidisciplinary setting by an ophthalmologist, uh, an expert thoracic surgeon, an anesthesiologist, that, uh, and uh, the radiofrequency ablation patients were evaluated uh, as uh, unfit for any kind of surgical intervention while the, radio, the wedge resection patients uh, were uh, considered unfit for lobectomy, but uh, operable. In addition, in the study, there is the lack of other outcome measures, such as uh, lung post-operative lung function or also post-operative quality of life. However, um, even if this limits, we can say that whenever possible, surgical resection, even if, even if it is limited, such as a wedge resection, must be preferred due to its lower recurrence rate in local site. And the RFA option um, can be, is to be preferred to, for true non-surgical candidates due to its uh, lower, um, lower invasiveness. Thank you. Olivia, may I start with a discussion? Uh, was that in every single case a conference-based decision on what um, therapy would, uh, was chosen? Uh, generally, yes. We discuss uh, about uh, a high-risk patient uh, in, in, every, in any case, uh, especially with uh, our anesthesiologist uh, that is... is uh, Decide to, to perf um, decide if uh, if uh, the patient can undergo a general anesthesia or not. Because uh, in our department, uh, radiofrequency ablation is uh, performed under conscious sedation with local anesthesia. Um, well, one one short question: the wedge resection was not connected with any lymph node dissection. Um, in, it depends. It depends on the patients and the general condition depends. If we have the necessity to perform a quick resection, uh, we did not perform a lymph node sampling. And uh, it, uh, I would like to underline that uh, sometimes which resection is performed also for to obtain a diagnosis. Uh, okay. so. mm -hmm. Uh, related to the lymph node, and the patients that had lymph node uh, d dissection, were there patients that were upstage, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so that they really had a higher stage than uh, oh. uh, stage one, uh, or, or did you just go back and look for those patients who pathologically were stage one, and those were what were uh, uh, included? Okay, we included only uh, stage one patients. Clinical, also, clinical or pathological stage one? Uh, pathological. Okay. okay. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I wonder if you looked at the specific reasons for determining high risk in these patients and whether there was a difference in, for example, patients with poor pulmonary function tests and otherwise good heart and uh, other conditions would tend to get a wedge resection while those with cardiac comorbidities and others would tend to get RFA. And, okay, uh, I, didn't, I did not show it in these uh, slides, but um, we evaluated both uh, not only lung function, but uh, a global risk. And uh, um, we found a better FA, uh, FEV1 value in the RFA patients in respect to which resection. It may seem a contradiction, but uh, uh, the RFA patients were really high risk and the, um, um, the comorbidities uh, um, regards uh, above all uh, cardiac risk, uh, cardiological risk. Uh, so most of patients have prior inf cardiac infarction or a previous uh, um, transitory ischemic attack. Uh, so um, the risk was a global risk, uh, not only based on lung function. But was there a difference in the two groups? Yeah, this was a, I did not show, but there was a difference. And uh, we, had, we found better uh, lung function for radiofrequency ablation patients. Uh, congratulations, great presentation. Uh, 
I'd like to know if you have any difference in between the groups in regard to the position of the lesion. If you have more central lesions when you do when you did the radio frequency ablation, because that could be a reason to have more uh, local recurrence if you have more heat sink effect. Or mm. How was the position of the lesions in both okay. groups? Um, yeah, thank you for this question because uh, I would like to explain that uh, sometimes uh, for really central re region that uh, uh, need um, extended resection, we uh, decide to perform radio frequency ablation because the extent of the lungs resection would be too much for that kind of patient. And for peripheral um, lesion, we try to perform a quicker which vets with which resection. Yeah. And uh, probably this is also a reason for the higher local recurrence rate, uh, and because a larger lesion uh, deep uh, in the parenchyma, parenchyma uh, are not so easy to complete uh, to complete ablate. Are you doing the um, radio frequency ablation yourself? The surgeons are doing it. No, generally the radiologist, but the um, indication was done was, uh, was given by, the, by the thoracic surgeon. Um, are, and how many surgeons are doing their radio frequency ablation themselves? This is impressive. Uh, actually, it is the radiologist to to perform in our department, but uh, we start uh, as a surgeon to perform the procedure. We start uh, me and uh, and uh, also Olivia and other colleagues uh, started to perform radio frequency ablation. And then actually, it, generally, it is the the interventional radiologist that perform uh, the. In in some cases, uh, uh, in some more um, difficult cases, together with us. But generally, we only uh, recover the patient in our uh, in our unit and. Uh, and uh, we are ready for some complications to, to put a drainage or some other things. I'm really, con uh, personally, I'm confused because we have this option of SBRT. And you should know that um, it, previously SBRT was three to five doses, and RTOG has a trial coming up where they're going to give one dose. So how do we justify doing RFA versus a treatment that you only need to give one dose of radiation therapy potentially and, and see an advantage. Can anyone help with that? I figured you'd say something. <laughs> <laughs> he has to. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, uh, what's happening with the SBRT, there's a lot of institutional push to use SBRT because it's expensive to get and the hospital makes a lot of money by doing SBRT yeah. procedures. I also think the clinical trials that are out there for uh, S SBRT are, are much, have so far been much better done. RFA has kind of been a little bit all over the place with, uh, with things, and people have kind of poo-pooed RFA uh, and said, you know, we're doing, a, we're, we have a high pneumothorax rate, why, we sh why should we be sticking needles into these patients and just do a treatment where we don't have that, where we, where we don't, in, you know, in include that. But, but I think the, these two tr uh, papers today uh, and also, uh, recently, we presented the uh, results of a multi-center trial, prospective trial, at CHEST uh, last uh, October. Um, and, and this is a 55-patient uh, study of stage one patients. And the three-year survival was over, uh, was about 55%. Two-year survival was about 70%. It's exactly the same as the RTOG uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the argument in, is, is the RTOG data is in medically inoperable patients. Right. I don't know if you remember Travis Crabtree's paper that showed, uh, that compared RTOG0236, medically inoperable, Z4032, uh, high risk operable, and uh, Z4033. And the patients with the best PFTs uh, were, the, uh, were the SBRT patients. Okay. So that tells you that uh, a lot of the patients who were deemed medically inoperable, treated with SBRT, were probably surgical candidates. Okay. Uh, and so, so, uh, you know, I just, I just think it's important to include this in our armamentarium and just to say that we can, you know, RFA is still here. And yesterday you heard about RFA and bronchoscopy. That's coming right. down the pipeline. Yeah. So pretty soon people will be able to uh, do a bronchoscopy and stick a probe into a lesion and cook it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
two two short questions and two yes, short answers. Just a comment. I can just yeah, say comment. disruptive innovation. You know, <laughs> 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 because uh, the radiotherapist with the intensity modified respiratory gated uh, radiation, they are they just made a huge progress. You know, and I don't think at the moment there is no reason to stick a needle into the patient. We will see the results, but. I think they got better, and if you don't have anything better, maybe bronchoscopy, I think, uh, or if he will disappear. But um, if there are no further questions, thank you very much. Okay.